And here is the second garden location. So these are the gardens at my mom and dad's house and there's a lot going on here as well. Now starting up here, I cannot take credit for any of this. This is my mom's handiwork, but it's so lovely right now. I just wanted to share it with you. The vegetable gardens are back through this grape arbor. And on this side is a seeded Concord grape that for any guesstimate may be over a hundred years old. It has been here for a long, long time and is still in great shape produces grapes every year. We're just waiting on those to color up. And through here, we've got several separate vegetable beds. There's a lot of cover crop in here where again, things have come out from the spring crops and are resting. And then we've got some that are actively cropped right now. So this first bed up here, you can see is just kind of stuffed full with things. I've got a lot of annual flowers and herbs and vegetables all kind of tucked together. And a lot of the same flowers that I had in my garden at home. So the big top marigolds and the jolt dianthus, nasturtium, holy basil, sulfur cosmos. But one of my favorite things that are happening in here right now are these hot peppers. These are three different varieties, Killian, Christian, and Damien. So it's an orange, a red, and a yellow hot. But what I love is the way these peppers are upright facing on these plants and are these cool, wicked looking little spikes. So this overall effect is almost like flames on this plant. And these guys are just loaded with fruit. So in the next series of beds back here, I've got more of the Carmencita castor beans. Some of our sweet potatoes are back here. And then a mixed cover crop of buckwheat and sunflowers and a bunch of volunteer collards that came up. This bed I had in daikon radish earlier in the year and then overplanted that with buckwheat. So the buckwheat's popping up now. This bed, our onions just came out of recently. After harvesting, if my onions are still a little bit damp, I do allow them to dry in the sun for a while and then I move them into the barn to finish the curing process. And I had another loss I completely lost my watermelon plant over here and my cantaloupe is very quickly going downhill. These were both taken down by cucumber beetles carrying um, bacterial wilt. But I've got one cantaloupe variety still clinging to life here. This variety is Bit of Gold. It's a personal sized melon and apparently much more disease resistant than some of the other varieties that I've been growing. And then my dad's Kentucky Wonder pole beans, which are a personal favorite of his. He plants these every year. Those are doing really well on the fence there. The garlic recently came out of this bed and I just went in and planted this all with a buckwheat cover crop. And then I've got more Brussels sprouts back here. And then in the way back here, We've got a bunch of different things going on. So in this big bare spot in the middle, this is where the potatoes just came out. And I am working on prepping these rows and those will be ready soon for planting my fall crops. I've also got some buckwheat cover crop, which will come down. And again, that will be space where I can plant some of my fall crops. And then I'm flanked on either side by tomatoes and sweet potatoes and more tomatoes in the back. Over here, I've got my hops trellis. 
And this is really a fun plant, even if you are not planning on making your own home craft brews. This is so pretty. I think it could almost double as an ornamental. It's also a very useful medicinal herb. It helps with relaxation and sleep. And it's really easy to grow up any kind of a strong supporting trellis. So as you can see here, I've just got a cattle panel arch and that does an excellent job of supporting this hop spine. Got more runner beans back here. And then my plan for this is a fruit garden area with a lot of small gooseberries, dwarf cherries, those types of things. I did not get them in early this summer when I wanted, so now I am waiting until it cools off a bit in early fall to plant this. Here I've got some repeats of the tomatoes I had in my own garden at home, and I made the mistake here, you can see I had these in tomato cages, which I should have known better, but they had a big storm come through and the weight of these great big top heavy tomatoes toppled the whole tomato cage. So I had to drive these stakes in and tie up my cages with baling twine. These really probably should have been done on the cow panels or just had a sturdier cage. And on the cow panels here, I've got some lima beans going on. And then of course my tomatoes. I got these planted a bit late. It was not until May 20th. So we're just now starting to get really into a lot of tomatoes being ripe. We're also starting to get into the disease. And for some reason, the disease pressure is worse here this year than it, was, than it is at my home. Last year it was reversed and I can't figure out why. So I am actually using a copper spray once a week or so on this foliage to try to combat the effects of these bacterial and fungal type foliar diseases. It doesn't totally stop the disease as you can see, but it does slow it down. And you may notice I've got lots of marigolds interplanted here. I honestly don't know if these deter the insect pests like they are claimed to do, but I think every little bit helps and uh, they're enjoyable to look at and easy enough to throw in here with the tomatoes. So that's what I do. Here are my midnight snacks that I mentioned earlier. And this is definitely a winner in the indigo cherry tomato test so far this year. Now you can see where these are totally shaded. They also have none of the indigo coloration but they do retain a lot of it anywhere that they are getting sun exposure. And the reason that I like these the best out of any is really the flavor. These have a really rich, complex, intense flavor with a lot of acidity, which I really like in a tomato. And they are just massively productive. I mean, you can see these panicles of fruit all the way up the plant, no signs of quitting. And I have grown this one in the past, and it is a very reliable performer. Big plants though, again, these are probably pushing eight feet. My dad has blackberries planted through here. See, again, these are just starting to ripen up. Got some turning black back there, but my oldest daughter tends to get out here and nab these as soon as they are ripe. She's worse than the birds. We are big asparagus fans here, so my dad just keeps planting asparagus. <laughs> this is all asparagus. We've got some up front. I, we've just got some everywhere. But I'm always impressed by how lovely it is when it starts to go to fern like this. More cover crop through here. So this is a section that I had solarized with a tarp for a full season to try to kill off weeds. When I pulled back the tarp this spring, we went in immediately with cover crop and planted, and I have a mix in here of the front is buckwheat, sun hemp, and some sunflowers, and in the back is sorghum Sudan grass. That will get chopped in the fall 
and then I will probably replant this in winter rye or some other fall cover crop and I'm doing this because the soil in this particular area is extremely heavy clay it's not great soil so we're really working on improving this and through here I've got my pumpkins a large okra planting which I mentioned and wild violet sweet corn. Now sadly this was all full of pumpkins. I lost every single one to squash vine borer this year except this guy back here is hanging on bless his heart and I even see one pumpkin. A decent sized jack-o-lantern pumpkin back there. The okra is doing awesome though. Like I said, there is nothing that stops this plant. Mainly the trick is just getting out here and getting it harvested before these pods get too big. Cause you can see it's been, oh, I probably, it's probably been a week since I harvested and these pods are just going nuts. That one's way too long, but amazingly like not entirely woody yet. But again, like they're better at this size. And I think we are getting very close on this corn. So I'm actually going to open one of these up. Maybe a smidge early. And this is wild violet sweet corn. Again, one of my absolute favorites. Oh, we're pretty close. That ear is nice and filled out. Take a look at that lovely purple blush on there. This will get darker as this ear matures, but really you don't want to let it get much darker than that for fresh eating. This is really optimal because these kernels are plump and filled out and juicy, and that is going to taste delicious. And then we've got a few more beds up here. Dad's apple trees. He's got a little bit of everything. Apples, pears, cherries, peaches, um, nectarine. I can't, I can't keep track of all of it. Here I've got more tomatoes and sweet peppers. And I have pretty much gone to growing all these bullhorn type sweet peppers. <laughs> I've moved away from growing traditional bells. I just have a lot better results with these and these will color up. Um, I've got red and gold varieties in here, but they are thick walled and sweet and juicy. And again, just they are better growing, better yielding than me for traditional bells and every bit is sweet and tasty. That tomato is putting on some really lovely fruit clusters. But again, we've got some of the foliar disease going on. <laughs> My last little hangers on. This whole fence was cucumbers and I got a couple good pickings off of it. And then the cucumber beetles took them down. So I've got one plant in here that desperately needs picked. That guy is way too big. I've got some summer squash hanging on back here. This is Smooth Criminal. I really like this one because true to its name, it has smooth petioles that don't scratch your arms all up when you pick, which is really nice. I just cleaned this all up. This is where all of my spring brassicas were. I got this mulched and all planted in buckwheat just a few days ago. And I've got some kale and collards left in there from this spring. Some volunteer amaranth. Which is funny because my dad can't even remember the last time he planted this stuff and it's still popping up every single year. It's really a cool plant. And through here, we've got the tunnel of tomatoes. So I've got two back-to-back -back cow panels, all trellised up with indeterminate tomato varieties. And again, you can see interplanted at the bases of these plants. I've got a lot of marigolds and basil. 
And in these brakes, I've got the Gurney's Beneficial Bug Blend, which has been drawing in the pollinators like crazy. But you can see, again, we've got a lot of foliar disease happening, unfortunately. A really nice fruit load on these plants. But if we lose all that foliage, they are not going to taste good. And some of these are faring much better than others. Got very little disease. For the most part, these look really nice and healthy over here. So really nice fruit size. Since you've seen these cow panel trellises all over my garden, you've probably gathered how much I love them. I've yet to find a method of staking tomatoes that I like better than this for growing indeterminate tomatoes. It just makes them so much easier to pick along with the advantages of improved air circulation, which helps cut down a little on the foliar disease. Down here, we're kind of coming to the last picking on these beans. This is Tongues of Fire, which is a multi-use. You can use these young as a snap bean or let them mature and use the beans inside, use them as a shell bean. So I am letting them all dry down so I can collect the shell beans. I've got Derby Bush Bean over here, which is one that I grow every year. Really sweet, really tender. I'm on, I think about the third or fourth picking of this one. As I mentioned, I fairly recently harvested my garlic and onions and potatoes and to cure all of this stuff, this is the solution that we have come up with. So this is just my dad's trailer. We've got a big screen laid on top of this and all of the garlic and some of the onions are sitting here. We've got the garlic toward the back so it does not get as much light exposure. Onions can take a little more and we will just leave these here for a couple weeks till they're all the way dried down. Then they will get strung up and hung up for long-term storage. The rest of the onions and the potatoes are in the barn. So again, we've had to get a smidge creative to find space and ways to cure all of these crops for long-term storage. So dad found some old loungers, I think at a garage sale, the old fashioned kind that have metal um, mesh underneath, just took the cushions off and we're using those to help dry out and cure our onions. You can see we've got another one back here. And then once these stems have dried all the way down and this skin around the neck of the onion is papery, I typically just braid these as long as the stems are intact. Sometimes that will happen. If that stem's kind of rotten, you want to use those up right away. And then I just tie these up with baling twine and I'll hang those up for long-term storage. Same setup for potatoes. We've just got some old screens, trying to give these guys maximum air circulation. I like to keep the potatoes completely out of the sunlight. You definitely don't want any sun exposure here. This is not optimal. Um, ideally for curing potatoes, you want cooler temperatures, but I'm just kind of working with the resources that we have here. And this seems to do the trick. I typically cure my potatoes for a couple weeks and then put them down in my cool basement for storage and they usually store pretty well. So there you have it. There's a lot to take in and there's a lot going on during the month of August. And if you enjoyed today's video and want to see more garden updates as well as tips and tricks and garden experiments, please consider subscribing to my channel, Growfully with Jenna. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.